Mungo and her son Trey will be assisting this morning, and they're going to be talking about the hate you give. So you can take it over whenever you wish. Thank you, Dr. Kilmore. All right. So, like she said, for the next several minutes, we, we will be, I will talk about, and then Trey and I will actually um, read from one of the chapters in The Hate You Give, um, and then I will interrupt from time to time to talk about that, uh, the section that we, we, we read. So, although published in 2017, The Hate You Give is a timely novel about a 16-year-old Black girl named Star who witnessed the murder of her childhood friend, Khalil, by an officer doing a routine traffic stop for a broken taillight. The current civil unrest occurring throughout the United States as a result of similar circumstances described in The Hate You Give provide a real-world justification for the importance of all books, not just books that fit our ideological and perfect vision of what we want society to be, not just books that sanitize our history and distort the present, but books that give voice to the voiceless, books that help explain and unpack complicated social issues, like yeah. protest. The words, the identities that those words describe, the experiences that those words depict can illuminate the reality of voices that go unheard and those experiences that are often disregarded or marginalized. The Hate You Give portrays a working Black family in America and the myriad of ways that racism can affect their lives. From code switching as a strategy to appear non-threatening and not be labeled too Black while attending an all-white private school, to following the street rules, snitches get stitches, Star wrestles with her agency to conform or resist and what each action actually means for her and those who she cares about. Angie Thomas allows us to see and feel Star's emotions in raw and unfiltered form. And I warn you, some of the words <laughs> are curse words, so if there are any minors that are attending, um, I'm just warning you. The protest described in The Hate You Give is familiar and reminiscent of the civil unrest that is reported in our current news cycles. Angie Thomas shows the complicated wave of emotions that tra transverse the mind when pondering questions. What can I do in response to injustice? She depicts the resulting hurt and anger after traditional methods of seeking justice follow their prolonged pattern of failure. Angie Thomas, through Star's character, gives us the dynamic and complicated scene of protesting when the justice system has failed to do their job. It's not as simple as just burning things and being angry. It's a lot more layered, a uh, nuanced situation. Chapter 23 opens with, the, with five of the novel's character riding in a car after the grand jury decided not to indict the officer that shot an unarmed black teenager doing a traffic stop for a broken taillight. The characters are Star, the main character, the protagonist, as well as the narrator of the story, her half-brother Seven, her white boyfriend Chris, Seven's half-sister Kenya, and their friend Devante. So Trey and I will begin reading. <clears throat> It's a quiet ride to Seven's grandma's house. I told the truth. I did everything I was supposed to do and it wasn't fucking good enough. Khalil's death wasn't horrible enough to be considered a crime, but damn, what about his life? He was once a walking, talking human being. He had family, he had friends, he had dreams. None of it fucking mattered. He was just a thug who deserved to die. Car horns honk around us. Drivers shout the decision to the rest of the neighborhood. Some kids around my age stand on top of a car as they shout, justice for Khalil. Seven maneuvers around it all and parks in his grandma's driveway. He's silent and unmoving at first. Suddenly he punches the steering wheel. Fuck! Devante shakes his head, 
This some bullshit. Fuck, Seven croaks. He covers his eyes and rocks back and forth. Fuck, fuck, fuck. I want to cry too. Just can't. I don't understand, Chris says. He killed Khalil. He should go to prison. They never do, Kenya mutters. Say it seven hastily wipes his face. Fuck this star. Whatever you want to do, I'm down. You want to burn some shit up? We'll burn some shit up. Give the word. Dude, are you crazy, Chris says. Seven turns around. You don't get it, so shut up. Star, what do you want to do? Anything, everything. Scream, cry, puke, hit somebody, burn something, throw something. They gave me the hate, and now I want to fuck everybody. Even I'm not so sure how. I want to do something, I say. Protest, riot, I don't care. Riot, Chris echoes. Hell yeah, Devante gives me dap. That's what I'm talking about. Star, think about this, Chris says. That won't solve anything. And neither did talking, I snap. I did everything right, and it didn't make a fucking difference. I got death threats. Cops harassed my family. Somebody shot into my house. All kinds of shit. And for what? Just as Khalil won't get? They don't give, they don't give a fuck about us. So fine, I no longer care. But... Chris, I don't need you to agree. I say my throat tight. Just try to understand how I feel, please. He closes and opens his mouth a couple of times. No response. Seven gets out and holds his seat forward. Come on, Lyric. Okay, so I'm going to stop at that point. Again, I know the language kind of cut steep. I'm going to be honest, as a parent reading this after my kid read it, I was like, whoa, I didn't prepare him for all of that. Um, so as a sociologist, my son has grown up <laughs> hearing a lot of this stuff um, and understanding the, um, how race plays out in society. Um, and although, uh, Although he read this book, it wasn't until the current civil unrest and uh, Joy, George Floyd particularly, particularly um, is when I think it became more real, which is why I wanted to, to talk about this book, um, because it was that moment, right, where the world had kind of slowed down. And so we were forced to reckon with the, the way life had been. Um, so before then, several years ago uh, when Trey and I decided to read this book it was when the movie of the same title The Hate You Give came out and um, both of us are fans of books tell a story better than the movie and so we wanted to read the book first so then that we could watch the movie together and so that's when we we watched this movie um, or that's when we read this book and then of course watched the movie um, and for the first time, I think it was when he was able to visualize what it is to be a black male in society, right? So mama talks about it from um, theoretical standpoints. He's, you know, heard some of the things that I've presented, written about, um, but never seeing it up front. And then, you know, it's one thing when you know you're a black male in America, but it's another thing when it hits you as, when, when you, you see yourself, right? And so he's older now. And so he could see himself in a lot of that imagery that was depicted. Um, and so the hate you give hits a little different. Um, it feels a little different now when you can situate yourself in the characters, right? And so then, and what's playing out in our current news cycles, you, you, you can see that that can be me. And as a mom, that could be be my son, right? And so books like The Hate You Give, I think, especially this chapter, gives that nuance and unpacks the actual uh, emotion and decision-making that goes in. Are we going to protest? Are, um, how do we get, first, how do we um, show our disagreement with the justice system? How do we um, show our, our dis, you know, disenchantment or disenfranchisement with what's going on. Um, and so we're going continue to continue to read. But as you see, the chapter begins with just this, this conversation with the boyfriend who 
comes from a very, you know, privileged background, um, not understanding what it, it is to walk around in society. Um, Star lives in a working class neighborhood. And so um, they are there now in the area where the, the protest um, is occurring as a result of the um, uh, inability to indict the officer. All right, so Trey, we're gonna... All right, you ready? Do you want me to read that? You, want to, you don't want to start here? All right, I know. Cars are up and down Magnolia like it's a Saturday morning and the dope boys are showing off. Music blasts, horns blare, people hang out car windows and stand on the hoods. The sidewalks are packed. It's hazy out and flames lick the sky in the distance. I tell Seven to park at Just Us for Justice. The windows are boarded up and black owned, is spray painted across them. Miss Oprah said there would be leading protests around the city if the grand jury didn't indict. We head down the sidewalk, just walking with no particular place to go. It's more crowded than I realized. About half the neighborhood is out here. I throw my hoodie over my hair and keep my head down. No matter what the grand jury decided, I'm still star who's with Khalil. And I don't want to be seen tonight. Just heard. A couple of folks grant that curse with that what the heck is this white boy doing out here look. He stuffs his hands in his pockets. Guess I'm noticeable, huh? He says. You sure you want to be out here? I ask. This is kind of how you and Seven feel like Willington, right? I love like that, Seven says. Then I can do. The crowds are too thick. We climb on top of a bus stop bench to get a, a better view of everything going on. King Lords in gray bandanas and Garden Disciples in green bandanas stand on a police car in the middle of the street chanting, Justice for Khalil. People gathered around the car record the scene with their phones and throw rocks at the windows. Fuck that cop, bruh, a guy says, gripping a baseball bat. Killed him over nothing. He slams the bat into the driver's side window, shattering the glass. It's on. The King Lords and G and Garden Disciples stomp out on the front window. Then somebody yells, flip that motherfucker. The gangbangers jump off. People line up on one side of the car. I stare at the lights on the top, remembering the ones that flashed behind me and Khalil, and watch them disappear as they flip the car on its back. Someone shouts, watch out. A Molotov cocktail sails to the car, and then, oof, it bursts into flames. The crowd cheers. People say misery loves company, but I think it's like that with anger, too. I'm not the only one pissed. Everyone around me is. They didn't have to, they didn't have to be sitting in the passenger seat when it happened. My anger is theirs, and theirs is mine. So what was just described by Angie Thomas is, um, the outward expression of the anger as a result of the, the um, failure to indict the police officer, right? And so what you see here is, so there are two gangs um, represented by the different color bandanas is a, um, is let it, lets us know that they're not on the same side, right? But because they have a common enemy or a common cause, they're all together in the neighborhood um, protesting, right? And so the anger then is expressed against the, the police car. A car stereo loudly plays a record scratching sound and then Ice Cube says, fuck the police coming straight from the underground and young nigga got it bad cause I'm brown. You'd think it was a concert the way people react, rapping along and jumping to the beat. Devante and Seven yell out the lyrics. Chris nods along and mumbles the words. He goes silent every time Cube says nigga, as he should. When that hook hits, a collective fuck the police thunders off Magnolia Avenue, probably loud enough to reach the heavens. I yell it out too. Part of me is like, what about Uncle Carlos, the cop? But this, is, this isn't about him or his coworkers who do their job right. This is about 115, the officer who killed Khalil those detectives with their bullshit questions, and those cops who made daddy, daddy lie on the ground for nothing. Fuck them. Glass shatters and I start rapping. I like this portion particularly because 
it gives the new un again the nuance of when you see the Black Lives Matter signs, Black Lives Matter signs, for instance, and then the immediate response is all lives matters, right? Or blue lives matter, right? Um, it's important to understand that as, as Angie Thomas does here, Star actually has a, a, an uncle and it's actually her favorite uncle who is a, a police officer, right? And so and it's important to know that when you think about the types of jobs um, the police, you know, police officers have, there are many black officers, right? And so for, for people like me who wear shirts um, that, you know, say Black Lives Matter, it's, it's not a, a um, judgment against um, police in general. It's against the system of policing. And so it's important to, to not make it an individual problem because when we make it individual problems, then we only come up with individual, individual solutions and not um, uh, system, or system level solutions, right? Macro solutions to fix the whole part of policing. And so the nuance that Angie Thomas uh, brings about has to do with the fact that she know that the fact that Star is 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 troubled. She's she is wrestling with the fact I'm unhappy. I'm angry. I watched my best childhood friend that I grew up with die for nothing. They the justice system failed to indict the police officer for murder, and now what can I do about it? Right. So this is the struggle. And, not, and, and me protesting police officers, how do I do that when my beloved uncle is part of that system, right? So the system that I'm protesting is also the system that someone I love is a part of, right? And so I think it's important to, you know, again, when we think about books that get banned or silenced, um, there, there's much to learn, right? And in this book written two years ago, it, the, it's a very timely for what we are seeing on the news every night, right? Like I could literally read a couple of paragraphs from this book and swear I saw it on CNN a couple of nights ago, right? Um, so books that give this type of nuance, because unfortunately, and we can, you know, we can have a let's talk about the, the news and how they get reported um, <laughs> conference another time, Paulette. <laughs> but we, we can, um, no matter, you know, I guess the leanings of, of the news, right? Um, it's important that books like this that are there, they can help people unpack, right? Because, you know, listening to me as a professor or um, to, you know, somebody on the news say something, you may argue with them and disagree with them. But when it's written in a novel form, right? So when it's written in a way where it, even though it's fiction, it still gives you insight into the complicated nature of some of our current social issues, people are more apt to listen, right? People are more apt to perhaps think about it. And obviously you're not gonna sit there and argue with the book you're reading, right? Um, and so it's really important that books such as this um, remain out there so that we can, we can have um, these moments of, of enlightening and these moments of, of learning about such a complicated issue. Okay, um, oh, I'll let you read that part. A block away, people throw rocks and garbage cans at the windows of the McDonald's and the drugstore next to it. One time, I had a really bad asthma attack that put me in the emergency room. My parents and I didn't leave the hospital until like three in the morning and we were starving by then. Mom and I grabbed hamburgers at the McDonald's at eight while daddy got my prescription from the pharmacy. The glass doors of the drugstore shatter completely. People rush in and eventually come back out with arms full of stuff. Stop, I yell, and others say the same. But looters continue to run. Glow of orange bursts inside, and all those people rush out. Holy shit, Chris says. It's no time. The building is now in flames. Hell yeah, says Devante. Burn that bitch down. I remember the look on daddy's face the day Mr. Wyatt handed him the keys to the grocery store. Mr. Rubin and all those pictures on his walls showing years and years of a legacy he's built. Miss Yvette walking into her shop every morning, yawning. Even pain in the ass Mr. Lewis with his top of the line haircuts. Class shatters at the pawn shop on the next block. Then at the beauty supply store near it. Flames pour out, both, 
pour out both and people cheer. A new battle cry starts up. The roof, the roof, the roof is on fire. We don't need no water, let that motherfucker burn. I'm just as pissed as anybody, but this, this isn't it, not for me. Devante's right there with him, yelling out the new chant. I backhanded his arm. What, he says, Chris nudges my side, guys. A few blocks away, a line of cops in riot gear march down the street, followed closely by two tanks with bright lights. This is not a peaceful assembly, an officer on, his, on a loudspeaker says. Disperse now or you will be subject to arrest. The original battle cry starts up again. People hur hurl rocks and glass bottles at the cops. Yo, Seven says, stop throwing objects at law enforcement, the off officer says. Exit the streets immediately or you will be subject to arrest. The rocks and bottles continue to fly. Seven hops off the bench. Come on, he says, as Chris and I climb off too. We need to get out of here. Smoke fills the air, more glass shatters. The pops get closer and the smoke thickens. Flames eat away at the cash of Van's place. Just for us, justice is fine though. So is the car wash on the other side of it. Black owned, spray painted on one of his walls. We hop onto Seven Mustangs. He speeds he speeds out the back entrance of the old Taco Bell parking lot, hitting the next street over. What the heck just happened, he says. Chris lumps in his seat. I don't know. I don't want it to happen again, though. And so again, you're able to see how Star is wrestling. This is her neighborhood, right? This is her neighborhood that um, the damage is being done to. And although everyone is angry, like she said, their anger is hers and her anger um, is theirs. And so that anger is, is um, or the, pri the, the rioting and the protests uh, and the looting that occurs is a result, is an outward expression of, of that anger, right? And so as her friend Devante uh, participates in the chanting, she is still wrestling with what is, what is it should I do, right? Because she doesn't want to see the, the neighborhood businesses get burnt up, right? So that was her uh, uh, I mean, she has, she gives an experience about uh, McDonald's, right, that her and her family went to and the drugstore that her and her family used. Um, and then as a result of the protesting and rioting, they, um, they are burning, right? So these are buildings that she has attachment to. Um, but as a result of what's going on, she's watching them um, burn. All right. Nigger's tired of taking shit, Devante says, between heavy breaths. Like Star said, they don't give a fuck about us, so we don't give a fuck. Burn this bitch down. But they don't live here, Seven says. They don't give a damn what happens to this neighborhood. What we supposed to do then, Devante snaps. All that kumbaya peaceful shit clearly don't work. They don't listen till we, till we tear shit up. Those Businesses, though, I say. What about them, Devante asks. My mama used to work at that McDonald's, and they barely paid her. That pawn shop ripped us off a hell of a lot of times. Nah, I don't give a fuck about neither of them bitches. I get it. Daddy almost lost his wedding ring to that pawn shop once. He actually threatened to burn it down. Kind of ironic it's burning now. But if the looters decide to ignore the Black-owned tags, that could end up hitting our store. We need to go help Daddy. Think he'll be okay with me helping out, Chris asks. He didn't seem to like me last time. Seem to, Devante repeats. He straight up mean mugs your butt. I was there, I remember. Seven Snickers. I'll smack Devante and tell him, shush. What, it's true. He was mad as heck with Craig is white. I mean, he was mad as heck that Chris is white. But hey, you spit that NWA stuff like you did back there. Maybe you'll think you're right. What, surprise the white boy knows NWA? Chris teases. Man, you ain't white, you light-skinned. Agreed, I say. Wait, wait, Seven says over laughter. We gotta test him to see if he's really black. Chris, you eat green bean casserole? Heck no, that stuff's disgusting. 
The rest of us lose it, saying, he's black, he's black. Wait, one more, I say. Macaroni and cheese, full meal or a side dish? Uh, Chris eyes dart around us. Devante mimics the Jeopardy music. Do, 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 do. <laughs> How to earn a black card for Chris Hundred? How to earn a black card for 300, Alex? Seva says it in an announcer's voice. Chris finally answers, full meal. Oh, the rest of us groan. Womp, 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 Devante adds. Guys, it is. Think about it. You've got protein, calcium. Protein is meat, Devante says. Not no dang cheese. I wish somebody would give me some macaroni calling it a meal. It's like the easiest, quickest meal ever, though, Chris says. One box and you're, and that's the problem, I say. Real macaroni and cheese doesn't come from a box. It eventually comes from an oven with crust bubbling on top. Amen. Seven holds his fist to me, and I bumped it. Oh, Chris says, you mean the kind with the breadcrumbs? Wait, what? Devante yells, and Seva goes, breadcrumbs? Nah, I say. I mean, there's like a crust of cheese on top. We got to get you to a soul food restaurant. The fool said, breadcrumbs. Devante said, I'm seriously offended. Breadcrumbs. The car stops. Up ahead, a road close sign blocks the street with a cop car in front of it. All right. Oh, what's your turn to do? All right. All right, he's getting tired. <laughs> okay. Um, so that little banter between um oh that banter between um the kids in the car, so they're all they're all kids actually, um, in the car talks about gives you the gives the the nuance right between so chris is 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 white he is star's boyfriend um the siblings and then the friend in the car and they have a relationship because three of them chris star and seven attend the same school so there is a friendship there and and a knowing there right and so they have this banter about how black chris is right and so their their measurement is based on food and music right um and the fact that he knew um the song by nwa um uh you know was a measurement and then he failed with the 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 question of how macaroni and cheese is cooked and is it a meal or or a side dish right um so i wanted to to show that banter because um when you grow up in a in multicultural environments like so Star was a working class uh, family, but her parents worked hard to send them to a private school. Um, there is this nuance and this difference there. And so as Star literally says at the beginning that she has, there's two stars. There's one star um, that's from her working class. And then there's another star who, who uses the strategy of code switching to get along at her, her all white private, private school. And so here we have the conversion of those coming together. And, and then, Lynn, then later, Chris asks, Chris, the white boyfriend, asks a couple of questions about, um, uh, about being, being black. And uh, I'm gonna share that here. And then, yeah, where are we? Yeah, all right. Get over okay. Um, where is the question? I'm sorry, I have it. Okay, here it is. Okay, fine. Chris says, since you guys want to go there with white people, can I ask a question about black people? Cue the record scratching. No lie. All three of us turn around and look at him, including Seven, who's driving. The car veers off the road, scraping against the curb. Seven cusses and gets it back on the street. I mean, it's only fair, Chris mumbles. Guys, he's right, I say. He should be able to ask. Fine, says Seven. Go ahead, Chris. Okay, why do some Black people give their kids odd names? I mean, look at you guys' names. They're not normal. My name normal, Devante says, all puffed up sounding. I don't know what you're talking about. Man, you named after a dude from Jodeci, Seven says. And you named after a number. What's your middle name? Eight? Anyway, Chris, Seven says, Devante's got a point. 
What makes his name or our names any less normal than yours? Who or what defines normal? If my pops were here, he'd say you've fallen into the trap of the white standard. Color creeps into Chris's neck and face. I didn't mean, okay, maybe normal isn't the right word. Nope, I say. I guess uncommon is the word instead, he asks. You guys have uncommon names. I know about three other Devantes in the neighborhood, though, says Devante. Right. It's about perspective, says Seven. Plus, most of the names white people think are unusual actually have meanings in various African languages. And let's be real, some white people give their kids uncommon names too, I say. That's not limited to black people. Just because it doesn't have a D or a La on the front doesn't make it okay. Chris nods. True enough. Why, why you have to use D as an example, though, Devante asks. We stop. There's another roadblock. All right, so that's the end of chapter 23. I chose that chapter specifically because I think, I mean, there's lots of important, I think, um, concepts and, and illustrations of the real world that uh, this book just depicts and wonderful language that makes you feel Star's emotions, makes you see the actual protest. Um, but chapter 23, I think, does a, a good job in having all of them really close together. Uh, so that's why I chose that chapter. Um, I, Trey here is going to, to end the, this presentation with um, reading at with reading the end of actual, actually chapter 24, which does a really good job of, of explaining um, the importance of first understanding the, the reality of lived experiences that are different than your own, right? And so um, books that give insight to non-dominant stories and experiences and explanations are really, really important. And if we, we ban them, if we marginalize them, then we miss a wonderful, um, just a wonderful part of the human experience that doesn't look like mainstream, right? Um, and so it's important that we give all books a chance and it's important um, that we continue to, um, to celebrate this, this, this uh, occurrence of banned books and continue to um, highlight them and put them uh, on the forefront. So with that, I will let Trey um, end the presentation. Once upon a time, there was a hazel-eyed boy with dimples. I called him Khalil. The world called him a thug. He lived, but not nearly long enough. And for the rest of my life, I will remember how we died. Fairy tale? No. But I'm not giving up on a better ending. It would be easy to quit if it was just about me, Khalil, that night and the cop. It's about way more than that, though. It's about Seven, Sakani, Kenya, Devante. It's also about Oscar, Aina, Trayvon, Rakia, Michael, Eric, Tamir, John, Izzel, Sandra, Freddie, Alton, Philando. It's even about that little boy in 1955 who nobody recognized at first, Emmett Till. The messed up part, there are so many more. Yet I think it'll change one day. How? I don't know. When? I definitely don't know. Why? Because there will always be someone ready to fight. Maybe it's my turn. Others are fighting too, even in the garden, where sometimes it feels like there's not a lot worth fighting for. People are realizing and shouting and marching and demanding. They're not forgetting. I think that's the mo most important part. Khalil, I'll never forget. I'll, I'll never, never give up. up. I'll, I'll never, never be, be quiet. quiet. I promise. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'll never give up. I'll never be quiet. Very, very, very good. I enjoyed the reading. Thank you, Trey, too, for helping. It was very good.